First of all, if you made it this far watching each of the videos in this series, you have my sincerest respect. You've already far surpassed those who want to learn HTML5 and CSS3 but don't commit the time and the effort to doing it. So you're well on your way to building pages for your own projects and for clients as well. What I want to do in this lesson is to wrap up this entire series and my goal is to orient you on what you should focus on next and where you can look for good information on building your own websites. I want you to take your newfound knowledge and apply it to building well-structured, accessible web pages that can be viewed on as many devices and in as many uh, web browser versions and vendors as possible. Now a great way to get your feet wet is to uh, pick apart other people's web pages. And by pick apart, I mean that you want to surf to them using Internet Explorer, find a web page that you like, and then open up the F12 developer tools, and then hover around the various parts of the site to inspect both the HTML5 and the CSS that they used in order to produce that result. Uh, one of my favorite things uh, to do for HTML5 when I was getting started was to take a look at the HTML5 boilerplate. Uh, it's pretty popular. It was intended to be a nice starting point for building your own web pages. Uh, however, I've been able to use it to learn more about semantic use of different tags and how real web pages have been are constructed today in 2012 um, by people in the know. Okay. Um, and so oftentimes people are looking for homework assignments and if you are one of those people then there's no better learning tool than to go to a website that you believe to be well designed and then try to duplicate what they did without looking at their code. Uh, now invariably when you start out you're not going to be able to duplicate what they did. So then that's a great opportunity to point you specifically at those areas that you're getting stuck on. Use the F12 developer tools and say, well, how did they accomplish that? And uh, little by little, you'll begin to understand uh, the code that is required to pull off some of the amazing effects that people are able to do uh, on their web pages. Um, and so as you're looking at uh, the HTML and the CSS code that comprise web pages out there on the internet today, there are a couple of things to, that I want to point out to you before you, you get stuck. The first is a topic we didn't really talk about uh, were uh, vendor prefixes. They look something like this on screen, where you have a dash and then a keyword like WebKit or a dash and a keyword like Moz. Uh, before a, a CSS property, in this case the border radius, followed at the very end by the border radius by itself without any prefix. Now, like we said much earlier in the series, CSS level 3's specification was broken up into multiple parts, and some of those par uh, parts are already being implemented by browser developers while others are still being agreed on. Some vendors want to support a particular new and upcoming feature of CSS Level 3 right now, today. So they add their vendor prefix to that property and they support that property unofficially uh, so that it um, allows web developers like you and I to get their feet wet to try it out and then provide feedback to the browser vendor. All other web browsers then would ignore that property, especially if it has that, uh, that vendor prefix in front of it. Eventually, the hope is that all new browsers will support a given feature, and so the need for the given prefix will be eliminated, at which point web developers can remove the prefix version and expect the style just to work, thus the use of the border radius at the very end of the style definition. Ultimately, it would be the last thing that's set if the web browser can understand that instruction. So each vendor has their own prefix. Uh, MS for Internet Explorer, Moz or Mo for Mozilla or Firefox, WebKit is used on the uh, Safari web browser, Chrome is used by Google's Chrome browser, O for Opera, and KHTML for Conqueror and all permutations of that uh, engine. Uh, just exactly which styles need this change with each new browser version. So I would just say if that you want to be on the bleeding edge of web development, you're going to need to 
have more than just a passing familiarity with this idea. You'll probably want to keep track of each new version of the web browser, see what changes have been added, what's been enabled by that given vendor uh, in the latest version. For now, just know what these are, why they exist, and then you can consult a search engine for a particular reason that a given prefix, prefix exists if it pops up as you're looking at other people's web pages and you don't know what it's there or what it's doing. Um, it's a great way to, uh, to force yourself uh, to, to learn it is when you come across something you don't recognize, stop right then and do a quick search for it, come to at least some familiarity with it and then continue on. All right, and along those same lines, when you're looking at other developers' work, you're gonna find a number of different approaches to the layout of web pages. Finally, we're talking about layout here in the very last video. The layout, as I've said a couple of times throughout this series, has always provided designers with a particular challenge. Uh, let me start with a small history lesson just to explain the progression of thought from the beginning until now. So when HTML first came out, the focus was on publishing scientific documents, not necessarily styling them from a graphic design standpoint. Now as a result, the HTML language was not really geared at presentation, or at least the presentation capabilities were rather limited. If you wanted to create a web page with two or three columns, you were forced to look for a workaround. And one workaround that became popular very quickly was to take the table tag and to turn it into a presentation tool. It allowed you to split up your entire web page into a series of grid cells and columns and rows uh, and so forth. And we briefly talked about some of the negatives when using table-based layout back in lesson nine, and I don't wanna reiterate those right now. But even though it's generally considered to be a bad approach, it's frowned upon in the web development community, you're still gonna come across websites that, that use this technique uh, either because they just haven't taken the time to update their web pages or they wanna keep things simple, perhaps uh, keeping things semantically correct isn't really important to them, at least not yet. Uh, I would suggest that they've really limited them, themselves uh, now that smaller screens for portable devices have become so prevalent. Uh, next up, designers then attempted to use the div tag to create a series of boxes, then use the float uh, CSS property to float those boxes up next to each other, either left or right. Uh, in this way, designers could create columns and sections and so on in their web pages. Now, the problem with this approach is that it limited the web pages, uh, or I'm sorry, it littered the web pages with dozens and dozens of div tags. In fact, somebody coined the phrase divitis as if it was some sort of sickness, okay? Uh, in fact, there's lots and lots of web pages that still take this approach. A few divs in an HTML5 web page is just fine, as we talked about way back, I believe, in lesson number six or seven. But semantically, the web page should attain for more clarity than simply saying that everything in this page is a generic division, which is the implication by using the div tag. Today, there are better, more reliable ways to lay out web pages. I'm gonna feature those in just a moment. Now, as you look through the code of well-designed sites, undoubtedly you're gonna to start to see some CSS file names repeating themselves site after site. The reason is that there is a healthy community of open source cascading style sheet frameworks, I guess you could call them, uh, or, or CSS helpers, files out there that somebody else created that everybody else borrowed from, all right? Uh, so I just wanna take a moment and review some of the most popular and briefly discuss and explain what they do at a high level and where to look for more information. So probably the most popular CSS file out there is the reset.css. It was created by um, uh, Meyer, I forgot his first name. However, uh, essentially what it does is, as he explains through here, is that it zeroes out virtually everything. Take a look at it. Every single tag, it sets the margin, the padding, the border to zero, the font size to 100, uh, inherit whatever the default font for the browser is, and uh, vertical align baseline. And then he does some other things like set line heights and so on. But essentially, it zeroes out everything. Now, in response to that, somebody created the normalize.css and it focuses more on overriding just those default styles across browsers that are inconsistent but it preserves many of the default stylings uh, so that you don't have to 
restyle everything from scratch the way you would if you use the, uh, the reset.css. Um, moving on and continuing to talk about layout itself, uh, uh, you know, what do we mean by layout? It, we're, we're talking about the positioning of major sections of the web page on the screen. And as we talked about a moment ago, there are many challenges to layout, including different screen size resolutions and new screen resolutions for mobile and tablet uh, based devices have complicated this even further. Through the years, there have been a number of workarounds and hacks to make it work. Many times there would be downsides to a given approach. So again, the, the table approach like we talked about a little bit earlier. If we want to be true to the semantic reason for the table, we should avoid using the table for layout. The fundamental problem is that CSS has never attempted to provide a definitive means for laying out web pages. So many designers have tackled this problem through the years and several have been kind enough to share their work so that others can use it or at least learn from it. And so there are a couple of popular approaches now. A fixed width grid layout and then a responsive web design, sometimes known as fluid design as two of the more popular ways to lay out web pages. Fixed width grid layouts split up the width of a page into a number of columns. Uh, you can then use classes to instruct each section of the web page how wide it should be. So um, there are two libraries for this, the 960 grid system, 960.gs. And if you take a look at some of their examples, you can see exactly how to do that. Um, Unfortunately, they don't show any here, and I don't want to take the time to, to talk about uh, it in any depth. But if you look at uh, some of these links, it'll show you how to use their classes to take a particular section, whether it be an article or a div or some block style element, and make it so many columns wide and then use another article or div or section and make it so many columns wide and they'll butt up next to each other naturally and you can see kind of what has been accomplished through these example web pages using this this popular library. Next up is the blueprint CSS.org and blueprint is pretty similar to the 960 uh, GS. Uh, it, works in a very similar sort of manner. So I'll leave it up to you to just take a look and compare these two and which one makes more sense for you personally. There's another one that's called um, the CSSGrid.net and it takes the grid style approach but it also does something that now borders on a responsive web design. So one of the things that encourages you to do is to resize the page and as you resize notice that not only does the text start to wrap, but you get to a certain width of the browser and the entire look of the page changes. And I think it'll do it one more time as we continue to go smaller and smaller. Or maybe not, maybe further down on the page. But this is what's referred to as a fluid or responsive design. Uh, so the fixed width grid layout approach is great if you're only targeting an audience of the browser on the desktop. However, it starts to break down on computers that have smaller resolutions like mobile and tablet devices. As a result, the responsive web design approach stepped up. So it de defines a series of viewports and optional layouts for a single web page based on about four or five common resolutions. Now for a more comprehensive overview, you can check out this post on Wikipedia. I posted uh, the uh, URL there on the page. But out of this thought process of fluid or responsive web design was born the notion that designers should be designing for the mobile experience first, then progressively enhancing the content for uh, and layout for larger and larger screen resolutions. And so to that end, there is this bootstrap uh, .css, which was originally created by Twitter and was made available for free by Twitter to the community. And so, uh, you know, it describes some of its selling points here, uh, not the least of which is that it was uh, built primarily for a, um, a mobile experience first and then a responsive to whatever size uh, a viewing area in a progressive enhancement uh, sort of way. So in my humble opinion, there are two great resources 
uh, out there that openly and thoroughly discuss these ideas and they're both created by a reputable group called A List Apart. And so if you take a look, there's two um, inexpensive books. You can buy them as a bundle. Mobile First is one of the PDFs and Responsive Web Design. Uh, and I purchased both of these. They're very well done. They're short, but uh, uh, fascinating reads. I highly recommend them recommend them. Now, if you do buy them, just know up front that this is an advanced topic. I don't think there's anything in these two ebooks uh, that would blow you away at this point. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's valuable to get uh, started thinking in this direction as soon as possible right out of the gate, uh, since this is currently where web development is heading. All right. So now that we're on the topic of recommending resources and books and websites and all that good stuff, let me recommend a few that were helpful to me as I put this series of lessons together. Uh, this is the second edition of this HTML5 book by uh, Bruce Lawson and Remy Sharp. I own both of the editions. Uh, it w has been really well written. It's really focusing on the differences between HTML and HTML5, so the previous versions versus what's been added in the new the newest versions, and it also uh, talks about things that are not even supported by most browsers just yet, but extremely helpful resource. Uh, as far as cascading style sheets go, I've got two books I'd recommend. The first one is um, by, uh, let me see, Peach Pit Press. Uh, I love all their books. I love the layout, the typography of the books, and how they went about putting it all together. This one by Jason Teague, CSS3 Quick Start Guide, Visual Quick Start Guide. Love that. And then if you want a more project-based approach where they start from scratch and then continue to build on until you have an entire website, uh, it's only, well, it's, I don't know, almost 300 pages. However, uh, all the images are in color, does a great job describing uh, why they're doing and what they're doing. It's the Stunning CSS3 uh, by um, uh, Zoe or Zoe uh, Gillenwater. Okay, so I highly recommend this book as well. And let me see. I guess that's about it. That's about all I have to say. I hope this series was helpful in laying out the major ideas related to HTML5 uh, and CSS3 and web design in general. Now, chances are your work is not over. There's much more to learn. In fact, there's always more to learn. I'll reiterate what I said at the very beginning of the series. I'm guessing that you're coming at HTML5 and CSS3 from a web developer perspective, not a web designer's perspective. So if you haven't already done so, I would recommend the following. Continue on to the Channel 9 JavaScript Fundamentals uh, series that I also created. Then pick a .NET language. Uh, the most popular are C Sharp and Visual Basic. In both cases, there is a C Sharp Fundamentals course and a Visual Basic Fundamentals course on Channel 9 that I created. And then finally, you're going to want to learn ASP.NET, which is Microsoft's platform for building dynamic data-driven web pages. There are many great resources available online to teach you ASP.NET, but allow me to add one final plug for the content on my own website, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.learnvisualstudio.net and uh, pay me a visit take a look at what I do so, and I appreciate uh, your support in that regard uh, so if there's any way that I can be of service to you I would love to have that opportunity if you have any questions by all means please ask below and I'd be happy to answer if I can and finally I wish you all the success as you continue in your web development career thank you Thank mm -hmm. you.